Hello and welcome. I'm Peter Afrasiabi, host of the Curious Lawyer Program and a partner at the law firm of One LLP with offices in Newport Beach and Los Angeles, California. Now, first of all, the views expressed today are my views. They're not the views of my law firm. I also teach at the University of California Irvine School of Law. These are not the views of the law school either. They're simply my personal views. So if you like them, that's great. If you don't, that's my fault too. So it's all on me. Now, first of all, I wanna to talk to you a little bit about the Curious Lawyer program. The Curious Lawyer is a program that's designed around intersecting different social, political, legal issues with our legal regimes, which allows us to explore off the beaten areas of the law. It's not your normal, staid, boring practice, CLE type programs that are technical and dry. This lets us take issues and, like I said, intersect them with the law and really explore different legal issues, which gives you a different perspective across a range of legal issues. You can even then incorporate many of these um, issues into your practice. You have analogies and metaphors you can work with. So for example, we've done dog law. We all love our favorite furry friends, our dogs. This lets us look at dogs and then look at tort law, criminal law, contract law, even trust in estates law. You can't believe the things people fight about over dogs. But in any event, dog law, CIA law, celebrity and paparazzi law. There's even a program that lets you look at the vicinage requirements of the Sixth Amendment to figure out if there's a little sliver of land in Yellowstone National Park where you could get away with murder. I'm not gonna tell you if you can or not, you gotta watch the program. But that's the Curious Lawyer program. Today's Curious Lawyer program is on deep fakes in the law. And we are going to look today then at the issue of this massive new technology that's around us and hitting us every single day in, the, in the, the news, the legal news. And of course, it's intersecting with the law and it's gonna give the law a whole bunch of legal issues to struggle with. And deep fakes, of course, are the use of modern AI, artificial intelligence-based technologies to create near perfect digital replicas of human beings, voice, look, mannerism, everything. And so let's talk about our agenda today before we wade into the realm of AI and deep fakes. First of all, we have to answer the question, what is exactly a deep fake? Secondly, we're going to look at these technology advancements that come from AI and deep fakes, and we are going to look at where they intersect and interact with our personal rights. And these personal rights are particularly important because it's our personal intellectual property right. Our right to control our name, our image, our likeness, our voice. That finds root in what's known as right of publicity. And these are state-based laws that we're going to look at. And so we will walk through, of course, the existing legal regimes that address, limit, control the right to use one's right of publicity with or without their consent. And so this touches primarily on state right of publicity laws. And we're gonna look at California and New York in particular, um, largely because they are prototypical um, state of right, right of publicity statutes and legal regimes that are generally similar across the country. But also we're going to look at New York in particular because New York in the early 2020s started passing some um, amendments to their statutory right of publicity law, really looking ahead at this deep fake technology that was coming. And New York was very ahead of the game on this. Um, and some of their deep fake laws that they passed at the time, deep fakes weren't even out. But now, you know, mid 2020s, deep fakes are everywhere. And you can see New York's law out there. We're also going to look critically at pending federal deep fake legislation. And we're going to look at where Congress now is getting involved in this action, largely because of the capacity for deep fakes to engage in really um, improper sexual abuse of people by creating deep fake sex um, avatars, sexual avatars engaged in sexual conduct. And so we're going to look at this, these pending federal laws that are existing and where they are going to address the use of one's name, image, and likeness um, digitally. And ultimately, we're going to look then and ask the question for you today, is it time to have a national right of publicity? Do we really need more federal laws? And do we just need to fully have the federal government occupy the field, um, pass a national right of publicity law, um, maybe, maybe not preempt state law, but at a minimum, like in the trademark realm, for example, have a federal national right of publicity 
across all aspects of the use of the persona and permitting federal court injunctive relief in particular to deal with this when we have um, avatars of, of you being used without your consent on perhaps social media platforms where you need takedowns and the like. So that's our agenda. Let's get rolling today. And our first um, issue we're going to look at here is assessing the problem. And you can see on our slide here, we have a variety of clips I'm gonna have you watch and we're gonna let you get an understanding of what deep fake technology is. So check out Tom Cruise here. Uh, that's why. Oh. <laughs> It's a little uh, embarrassing, you know, it reminds me, I was once in the, uh, Russia, I ran into uh, Gorbachev. <laughs> he said, you know, Mr. Movie Star, are you nervous? I said, no, Mr. Uh, Mr. Gorbachev, I'm not <laughs> nervous, I don't. He goes, well, remember how much a polar bear weighs? <laughs> I said, polar bear? He said, enough to break the ice. <laughs> It's the last time I've ever seen Mikhail Gorbachev. What's up, TikTok? You guys cool if I play some sports? I love it. More for the audio experience. As much as the momentum. Hey, listen up, sports and TikTok fans. If you like what you're seeing, just wait till what's coming next. <laughs> I'm gonna show you some magic. It's the real thing. <laughs> I mean, uh, it's all the real. Well, there you have it. It wasn't Tom Cruise. Mind-blowing, isn't it? So what you should know about that Tom Cruise deepfake is that that was from 2021 or so. Already by the mid-2020s, the technology is generally generationally ahead of that. But that was incredible. You watch that and you go, it's Tom Cruise. Of course it's Tom Cruise, but of course it's not. And this is how actors were able to use deepfake technology to have someone physically act and perform those sort of skits, for lack of a better word, that you saw of Tom Cruise. But the digital technology put Tom Cruise's face over the person. But the technology has gone beyond that because now we don't even need an actor. We can have it be entirely digital avatar based. Now, that was a Tom Cruise example. Often what's going on, and you've heard about this in the news obviously, is that these deep fake technologies have a, have a vicious sexual angle to them often. And so the famous cases recently, and this is sort of like late 20, mid, mid late 2024 or so, um, involves Taylor Swift and Congresswoman Ocasio-Cortez from New York, both of whom um, were the victims of sexual deep fake um, technology where people basically took pornographic images of women actually performing sexual acts or just being naked and whatnot, but put Taylor Swift's um, and the congresswoman's face um, on the tech, on the avatar to make it look like it was them in nude or involved in sexual conduct. Um, and those are the types of ones that have got the massive national attention because of the, the profound damage that it does to people, obviously, as you can imagine. Now, it's not just sexual um, uses, and it's not just kind of comedic, silly things like the Tom Cruise one. We also have um, fake issues occurring in news and the political realm, news realm, that have massive implications. I mean, there's obviously a, a famous case you may have heard about of fake robocalls going out ostensibly by President Biden that weren't President Biden, but it sounds like him. And now we're gonna look at another clip. Um, here you have President Obama, so let's check this out. It got me thinking about my full-time employees and their ability to survive on $8 an hour in New York City. And foremost in all of our minds has been the loss and the grief felt by the people of Orlando. Most of us don't get our health care through the marketplace. We get it through our job or through Medicare or Medicaid. And what you should know is that thanks to the Affordable Care Act, your coverage is better today than it was before. Women can get free checkups and you can't get charged more just for being a woman. 
give his employees and hope together to pass a common there's a bill that would boost America's very, very hard times. Some progress, at least in, within the small confines of the legal community. I think it's real important. Uh, here we go. Uh, President Barack Obama, uh, when you uh, giving a speech, uh, make sure you use uh, a lot of pauses. America's businesses have created 14.5 million new jobs over 75 straight months. We are developing technology. Every technology can be used um, in some negative way. And so we all should work towards uh, making sure that it's not going to happen. And uh, even um, one of the interesting directions is that once you know how to create something, you know how to reverse engineer it. And so you can, um, uh, and so one could um, uh, create methods for identifying um, uh, edited videos versus um, real videos. And there you have it. That was not President Obama. You could, you could see the legitimate, illegitimate uses and just how good the technology is. You'd swear, the fake one, it really is President Obama. And here we have, let's check the next one out because this is, gives you a sense of what can happen in the news in terms of we can understand fake robocalls and you know fake messages from ostensible political leaders, but we can also now have news avatars of, of famous news um, celebrities ostensibly presenting news that isn't even real. So here, check out Anderson Cooper. Second youngest son. He's suggesting it came out of nowhere. What we subsequently learned is it may have come from the former president or his legal team acting in bad faith. This is a deep fake example of what is possible with powerful computer and editing. It took around 72 hours to create this example from scratch using extremely powerful GPU. It could be improved with more computing time, but 90% of people cannot tell the difference. And there you have it. Part was him, part wasn't him. It's incredible. So we've now seen examples of the voice and the image of someone um, in terms of the avatars, but I want to really zero in on the voice a little bit here. So let's on this next um, AI clip look at Morgan Freeman. I am not Morgan Freeman, and what you see is not real. Well, at least in contemporary terms, it is not. What if I were to tell you that I am not even a human being? Would you believe me? What is your perception of reality? Is it the ability to capture, process, and make sense of the information our senses receive? If you can see, hear, taste, or smell something, does that make it real? Or is it simply the ability to feel? I would like to welcome you to the era of synthetic reality. Now, what do you see? There you have it. How incredible was that? Morgan Freeman's voice being replicated by AI. You can now stop and imagine the capacity for misuse here. It's not just sexual misuse and sexual content, but it's massive commercial misuse of people. I mean, you could imagine. Which of you watching this as a lawyer with your small law firm like mine wouldn't love to have an AI of Morgan Freeman or President Obama saying that Peter's the greatest lawyer I've ever met. You should hire him. I mean, how could business go wrong with that, right? This is sort of an example of where the misuse comes in. Now, it's not just celebrity misuse, of course. And there's a couple of famous cases um, from 2024 that I'll talk to you about. One is from literally my backyard. It's from Laguna Beach High School. My daughter's actually a senior at Laguna Beach High School graduating in 2024. And this occurred on the campus in 2024 where, and it reached national news, where some students had taken the AI technology and had done the kind of sexual AI um, um, avatars of some other high school students um, at the school, which of course is illegal and lawful and improper and made national news. And another example that you can look at is from Baltimore in 2024, and this is sort of teacher on teacher, and this is an example of where really deep fake technology has a capacity to cause profound destruction of, of people's careers. And so here we had a video that was issued of the principal making racist and anti-Semitic comments. Parents were calling into the school wanting him fired, death threats, the whole nine yards. As you could imagine, it was incredibly inappropriate stuff he was saying. But it turned out he wasn't saying it. It was a complete deep fake made um, apparently by someone else at the school 
to get back at him. And so this lets us see the technology and how robust it is and how it can afflict any person. It's easy to use technology, it's easy to make technology, and it can have a huge impact on people. Um, and so this is what's forcing us at The Curious Lawyer and as lawyers to start looking at deep fakes to understand what is the legal regime going to do with this to manage it. And so we are going to look, as you see on our next slide here, at the problems with the existing legal framework um, that relate to the commercial uses via artificial intelligence of others, names, voice, and likeness. And so basically, as we now know and have seen, AI technology can let us use this technology to replicate anyone's voice, likeness, image nearly perfectly. And this is what's important because in the analog old world that we're going to look at, if you wanted to take advantage, say, of Peter, you'd need to hire, if you, not that you'd ever want to um, imitate me, but if you did, you'd need to hire an actor that looked like the person, pay them to replicate the voice, incredibly expensive, uncertain if it had value, right? I mean, very, very hard to do. Didn't have much um, angle unless you really were going after a celebrity. And we'll look at some of those examples shortly. But now the technology is cheap and you can do it cheaply. This requires us, of course, to get into then the state-by-state -state legal regimes that relate to the right of publicity. We're going to look at the current legal frameworks. And then we're going to look at the, the back end of this program at digital AI uses on the national platforms and how we don't have federal causes of action yet, but how we need to be looking at these um, pen, pending federal deep fake laws that give federal causes of action to address the problem. So let's get started and ask, what is the right that we're talking about, this personal intellectual property right in your name, image, and likeness? Where did it come from? And you can see here on our slide, this right at common law was first conceptualized over a century ago, late 1800s, by um, Samuel Warren and Louis um, Brandeis, Justice, eventually Justice Brandeis in the U.S. Supreme Court. They wrote a seminal law review article, The Right to Privacy, in the Harvard Law Review in 1890, um, discussing this idea that we have personal privacy rights in other words, some sort of personal intellectual property right. Now, this existed in, in the common law in various states, and it eventually started getting codified. In California, for example, it was codified in the 1970s. And as of today, it's been codified in 35 plus states. In some states, it's still common law. And this is a distinct right to copyright and trademark rights. This is not the same as content creation rights that inherit in copyright. It's not the same as brands and marks exactly that exist in trademark law, but it is a common law right. And it has actually made its way to the Supreme Court. So real quick, there's a case, Zucchini versus Scripps, and this involved the famous human cannonball. And basically what happened is uh, there was a performer of the human cannonball, and his whole performance, his whole shtick basically, was being blown out of a cannonball, cannonball, flying through the air, landing, standing up, and saying, aha, you see what I did. And that was how he made his money. He was a human cannibal, incredibly valuable, and his right of persona attached to that performance. So one day, a you know, news, news company re records the performance, broadcasts it on television without his consent, and he sues. And he sues in Ohio, this was in Ohio, under his right of publicity. And he said, I, my name image likeness is my persona. You didn't have consent to show it. Um, and so he sued and the news companies said, well, wait a second, we have a first and 14th amendment right to show this, it's newsworthy, we can show it. And the US Supreme Court said, no, um, whatever first and 14th amendment rights you have, don't go so far as to abscond with the entirety of his video sequence, show it to people um, and abridge his right of publicity. And this was sort of opened the, the floodgates, so to speak, to write a publicity claims in terms of delimiting the ability of others to take and use your right of publicity. So the big picture overview of the right of publicity is that this is a statutory or common law right in many states. And you can see on our slide here, there's a, a, a twirling woman, a, um, you know, a, a dancer, and that's her performance right, like the human cannibal. Um, and so it's an IP right to protect against the unauthorized use of one's name, image, likeness, voice for commercial gain. Now, of course, that's a picture I took, so I'm not infringing copyright, but of our tango dancer and the tango dancer, um, this isn't, we're not using her commercially here, but it's just an illustrative example, which is why it's fair use ultimately here for the use of that picture um, that I took. But the root right is this right of publicity, and it's the right of everyone to control the commercial use of their identity, name, image, voice, or likeness. And this right can last from 10 years to 100 years. It can be post-mortem. 
And it depends, it's different state by state. And this is one of the complexities in the, the United States in the 2020s is that we have a hodgepodge regime of different state rules that are different with different rights for different people depending upon the state you're in. Now, post-mortem, some states actually um, allow a po post-mortem right only if you were domiciled in the state at the time of death um, or if you resided there at the time of death. Other states say, regardless of um, where you died, um, we will attach a post-mortem right to you in our state, such as Indiana, for example. And so this creates a lot of legal uncertainty as to non-residents' rights, depending upon where they lived. This post-mortem right in some states, it requires that when you die, your name and likeness actually had commercial value. So it's for celebrities, for example, um, James Dean, you know, you know, celebrities like that, that if they had commercial value at death, um, then their postmortem right would survive. If you're just a regular person like me who's got no v commercial value to your name or persona at death, it wouldn't survive. Um, some states also have registration regimes. So that's our big picture overview. California is basically an exemplary one that we just look at because it's kind of your prototypical state one. And so you see on our slide, um, California Civil Code 3344, and it protects against unauthorized uses of another's name, image, voice, signature, likeness, and photograph in commercial advertising. And what's important is that um, this delimiting use to commercial advertising. So it's not just any use, it really is focused on if someone's exploiting your name, image, voice, likeness um, for commercial purposes. And so the prima facie case basically asks, is there a knowing use of pl plaintiff's protected identity? Was the use for advertising commercial purposes? And is there a direct connection between the use and the commercial purpose? And if so, then you're off and running, you have a lawsuit you can file in California, you can get um, some um, enhanced damages, punitive damages, you can get attorney's fees. That's not true in every state. So this is why we get a lot of form shopping where you go because of the remedies. And in California, at least for deceased, the rights last for 70 years after um, death. So if you think about um, famous celebrities who may have died in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, whatnot, you know, in California, that right of publicity lasts for 70 years after their death. And so up until the AI age, that would mean that maybe you go to, you know, some famous celebrity's estate and say, hey, I wanna use like their photograph in, you know, some advertising campaign I'm doing, or I wanna sell some furniture and name the couch after them. For example, this type of thing, which has happened but suddenly with AI, we can bring people back to life, right? With near perfect technology. So you could imagine, um, you, know, you know, Whitney Houston now appearing in new movies for decades or performing new concerts with incredible avatar technology or, you know, Clark Gable appearing in new movies or other famous deceased actors appearing in new movies. We may see Casablanca part two and we get to find out what happened when Rick and Louie walked off the tarmac? And all of this can be done with AI technology, which means for heirs of deceased celebrities in particular, massive new value that's been created by this new technology realm we're in, in terms of opportunities um, for exploitation of the right of publicity. And it also means massive opportunities for inappropriate exploitation, which means there will be a lot more litigation in the coming years over right of publicity. Let's pivot now to the other side of the states, to New York. And for New York, um, same basic statute as California, but we're gonna focus a little bit here on their post-mortem rights because for decades they didn't have one and this created a big problem. For example, if um, famous celebrities happen to be domiciled in a residence of um, New York when they died, um, it could mean there was no right of publicity that descended to the heirs. This was a big problem for the Marilyn Monroe um, estate, for example, because she was technically a resident there when she died in California. Um, and so it, you can watch my deceased right of, my, um, deceased right of publicity program if you want to go learn all about that in great detail. Um, but basically, New York in the 2020s created a cause of action for deceased personalities and performers so that they could, um, their heirs at least, could also monetize this. And as you see on our next slide here, New York created this blueprint for the, really the modern digital era, and it was aware of these coming technological changes, 
and you see here section 50 F2B, it created a new cause of action as of the early 2020s where digital replicas of deceased performers were used in scripted audiovisual works as fictional characters or for a live performance of a musical work. So there you have it. Whitney Houston doing a new concert or, you know, Rick and Louie in Casablanca part two. Um, you know, we see Humphrey Bogart and, you know, suddenly in new commercials or TV shows, New York's got something to say about it now. And so the definition of a deceased um, performer is def defined, of course, and digital replicas are defined. A digital replica is an important definition. It's an original computer generated electronic performance. And so this is basically AI technology at work to create this. And so what it's aimed at, as you see here, is the unauthorized use of a hologram of a deceased performer to generate a new performance at a concert or a play or as part of a movie or television or in an online venue. And so that's their awareness of AI and AI technology that's coming. But let's pause because I'm going to stay in the analog world before we really go deeper into the AI world. And let's look at an example of voice because I showed you those voice clips early on and you saw how voice worked. But we should also understand how voice works in existing right of publicity litigation. And this is going to bring us to the 1980s, the decidedly analog world. And the case is Midler versus Ford. It's reported at 849 F second 460. It's from the Ninth Circuit in 1988. You see it here on our slide with a picture of that Mercury Sable. It was a Ford Mercury Sable car. And let's listen to this commercial that Ford put out for the car. Do you There's a car Tell that just asks to be driven. You're my love man, oh baby. Mercury is bringing a sophisticated new shape to the American road. Introducing Sable. Mercury, the shape you want to be in. All right, so there you heard that commercial. Turns out that wasn't Bette Midler singing. Now this is, of course is 1988. It was not an AI voice of Bette Midler. It was a sound alike. It was someone who could perfectly replicate her voice. And so basically here's what happened. Ford wanted to sell this car and it wanted to inspire these nostalgic ideas um, from the 1970s and famous songs. And so they came to Bette Midler and they said, hey, we want you to sing one of the, the songs that came out on one of your albums from the 70s. Do you want to dance? Um, you know, for a commercial for this car. And Bette Midler said, no, I'm not interested in associating my voice and singing a song for you to help you sell cars. Just not, not what I do. Well, Ford was not deterred. They decided, you know what? We're gonna get, we're gonna clear copyright licenses from the copyright holder, which wasn't um, Bette Midler, so they could get the right to perform the song in their um, commercial. And we are gonna go find a sound alike. And that's what they did. And so they found someone who could replicate her voice perfectly. Um, they had her sing the song. They put it in the commercial. You, everyone thinks Bette Midler singing it. Everyone goes, oh my gosh, Bette Midler. She, she loves Ford Mercury Sable cars. So in any event, Bette Midler was not amused and she sued saying that you took my voice, my right of publicity, which my voice is part of. It's my persona, my personal intellectual property. It goes up to the Ninth Circuit. Here's what the Ninth Circuit held. Why did the defendants ask Midler to sing it if her voice was not of value? Why did they studiously acquire the service of a sound alike and instruct her to imitate Midler if Midler's voice was not of value? What they sought was an attribute of Midler's identity. Its value was the market value would have paid for Midler to have sung the com commercial in person. The human voice is one of the most palpable ways identity is manifested. Very important statement from the Ninth Circuit, which is gonna have massive ramifications in our digital world. Now, it's not just voice, it's also likeness and creating avatars, so to speak. And this keeps us in the analog world, but we're going to look at robots, sort of early AI almost. And this brings us to the case of white versus Samsung. And you see here on our slide, it's reported at 971 F second 1395 from the Ninth Circuit in 1992. And then you see a picture of a robot, Vanna White, turning the Wheel of Fortune letters. And this is an ad that Samsung put out. And it basically created a robot version of Vanna White. And basically what it was saying is, you know, Samsung look way into the future in technology. We're gonna have robots, AI robots one day. 
Who could imagine such a thing in 1992? And here we are in 2024 and later, and we now have robots. Um, and we will certainly have digital avatars able to go and turn, turn letters. And so basically, they created a commercial to sell their computers and, well, I guess it wasn't even cell phones back then, but it was their computers and stuff. And they put a wig and a jewelry on it. It was next to a Wheel of Fortune board and it's made to look like Vanna White. Um, and it's instantly recognizable as her. And so White, like Bette Midler before, was not amused. And so she sued under California right of publicity law. And here's what the Ninth Circuit held. Television and other media create marketable celebrity identity value. Considerable energy and ingenuity are expended by those who have achieved celebrity value to exploit it for profit. The law protects the celebrity's sole right to exploit this value, whether the celebrity has achieved her fame out of rare ability, dumb luck, or a combination thereof. Because White has alleged facts showing that Samsung had appropriated her identity, the district court erred by rejecting on summary judgment her common law right of publicity claim. Claim reinstated. Let the jury figure out what that's worth. Let's look real quick at this clip here because this is Judge Kaczynski, who was a former Ninth Circuit um, Judge Kaczynski, um, discussing in 2007 the Vanna White case in 1992 and this idea of right of publicity and what the Ninth Circuit held. And so let's just look at this clip for a couple minutes. Um, um, uh images that people have in their minds. And you know, this is the Vanna White case is, is, is a, uh, is a uh, classic example. If you take the Vanna White display uh, and you look at the robot with just the wig and the dress, you have, uh, you know, it says nothing uh, whatsoever. I bet you you could put uh, that just the robot alone. Take take away take away the uh, the um, the display there, and uh, put um, uh, put the, put just a mannequin there. Nobody would uh, think it's Vanna White. You then add the 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 um, uh, additional material, particularly the game board, and immediately people think Vanna White. Now, what do they think? Do they think this is really Vanna White? Well, I don't think so. Uh, in fact, they are making it very clear this is not Vanna White. The advertisement was, if this is, um, this would be the case in 2012 AD. They were a little bit optimistic. That I think they thought that at that point we'd have robots who did these things. But the, but, the, but the whole idea was that Vanna White, the person Vanna White, would be replaced by a robot. And that's sort of a funny thought. Uh, now. The only role that Vanna White plays in that, in that whole sequence is she is the person being replaced. You think about the name. You think the image of Vanna White comes into your mind. And for the fact that they bring the image of Vanna White into your mind, uh, the um, Samsung was required to pay Vanna White um, damages about what, $400,000. Um, uh, Vent and Ratzenberger decisions uh, was somewhat the same thing, uh, and that is if you take those those uh, those two individuals. So there you had Judge Kaczynski talking about the right of publicity, and now let's look at our final case, and this is looking at where some celebrities have tried to frame these cases and gone too far and have not been able to establish a case, and this brings us to Nancy Sinatra versus Goodyear Tire and Rubber. It's reported at 435 F second 711, and this is from the Ninth Circuit in 1970. It's a very, very early right of publicity type case. This is before we had statutory right of publicity in California, and it's an example of, again, a celebrity trying to protect what they claim is their um, image and likeness and performance. And so here, let's watch this clip real quick of a Goodyear commercial. What are the hot cars wearing this year? Boots. Wide boots. GT tires from Goodyear. These boots are made for rolling wherever cars are hot. Wide boots GT from Goodyear. What sports cars need, they've got. Check the specs. Built low and wide like racing tires. Low cord angle. Four plies polyester cord. Track tested at 130. Boots 
HTT from Goodyear. What sports cars need, they've got. If you drive a high-performance car, you need Goodyear's finest high-performance tire. So there you have it. Goodyear um, used a song that was famous. Nancy Sinatra had sung that song, of course, and they, again, they cleared the rights for the song, and Goodyear used the song in a commercial. And Nancy Sinatra sued, saying that, look, you, you know, used the song and the arrangement of dancers in short, you know, go-go skirt dresses and all that, dancing, and that looked like the video that I had made for my song at the time, and I was famous for that song, you know, and that whole dance and that look. And so that had acquired secondary meaning under state law, which was protectable. And so basically what she said is that that song, as performed by me, functioned as a trademark indicative of me such that any use of it um, is improper. And so here we have now an example of this case going up to the Ninth Circuit. And the Ninth Circuit said, no, that's too far. You can't control general performances and dresses and of of women in short dresses singing a song and stop anyone and sort of, in essence, monopolize the ability to perform a song by way of state um, common law right of publicity type laws. And so what the Ninth Circuit held is, held is that Sinatra and Goodyear were not in competition. Goodyear wasn't trying to pass off its tires as her products. And so they, under this sort of narrow interpretation, the Ninth Circuit basically said that you don't have a federal or state right to control your performance that, that denies others a right to make musical performances. Um, and there was no holding out by Goodyear of the video of actually being Sinatra herself. Every, no one, they weren't telling anyone it was Sinatra. It's not like Bette Midler where they were passing it off as her voice. It was obviously not her in the video. It just was her song and it was kind of evocative of her. And so basically Sinatra was encroaching too much into um, federal protections for copyright and stretching state law too far. And so what they held is that there is no right there. So that's an example of the limits of how far you can take a state right of publicity type claim. And so what ultimately this is raising here is the, this question you can see on our slide here of whether there's a need for a uniform federal right to preempt ultimately the field. And the question we're getting at, and you can look at the slides here that, that, that we're pushing towards is, in this modern technology world where technology such as AI is ubiquitous, it's cheap, it's getting cheaper every year, it's getting more ubiquitous, it's getting easier to use, such that anyone with a computer, as you saw, even high school kids in Laguna Beach, California, who should be out surfing, right? They're able to do it, right? So as the technology has become so robust that anyone can take others' personas and create fake, fake um, performances of them or testimonials or whatever it may be, we are running now into a world where we have to look at how do we stop this if we need to stop it. And if we also have social media platforms where this technology can be replicated, spun out there, you know, retweeted, reforwarded, reblasted, recopied quickly, we suddenly are looking at questions about, okay, well, should it depend upon 35 plus different state statutory regimes, all of which are different with different remedies and different rules? Some have you know, rights post-mortem, some don't. Some states don't even have a statutory right, and you have to put this under sort of general common law rights. And if you are in North Dakota, how do you get some state court in North Dakota to tell Facebook in California to stop um, you know, broadcasting a video that someone is suing over, right? Yeah. This starts raising the question ultimately of do we need a uniform federal um, right of publicity that either preempts the field or sits coterminous in the field like trademark law where you have both federal trademark laws and then state trademark laws also um, so that we have rapid ability to have federal courts anywhere in the country issue nationwide injunctive relief type orders um, for takedown. Um, purposes. And so I would submit that we do need, we're now at the point that we do need a uniform federal right to step in here and start looking at this. And that's sort of the big question that's on the table. And that question is on the table largely um, because of AI technology now. And we have very tentative steps being taken by um, the Congress to address parts of our personal right of publicity because of the sexual exploitation that's occurred 
with some pending legislation. And so let's look at the first one here on our slide, you see. It's known as the Preventing Deep Fakes of Intimate Images Act. <clears throat> and so let's take a look at this. An individual who is the subject of an intimate digital depiction that is disclosed in or affecting interstate or foreign commerce or using any means or facility of interstate or foreign commerce without the consent of the individual where such disclosure was made by a person who knows that or recklessly discards whether the individual has not consented to such disclosure may bring a civil action against that person in an appropriate district court of the United States for relief as set forth herein. Now the definition of intimate digital depiction is as follows. The term intimate digital depiction means a digital depiction of an individual that has been created or altered using digital manipulation and that depicts the uncovered genitals, pubic areas, anus, or postpubescent female nipple of an identifiable individual, the display or transfer of bodily sexually fluids onto any part of the body of an identifiable individual or from the body of an identifiable individual, or an, in an identifiable individual engaging in sexually explicit conduct. And so what you can see that's particularly important here is this basically means that it's both the creation from scratch of an intimate digital depiction. So you literally just from scratch create some version of me, um, you know, naked, engaged in some sort of sexual behavior. That would be an intimate digital depiction. Or it could even be you take and alter and digitally manipulate, um, you know, imagine some actress in a television show and someone takes her wearing clothes and then removes the clothes. Now all of a sudden you have altered using digital manipulation technology an existing piece of footage in a, this sexual way, the way that definition is, that would also violate the law too. So the law is very encompassing and broad in terms of how it approaches intimate digital depictions and deep fakes. Now let's look on our next slide here at the damages that one um, can get under this preventing deep fake of intimate images law, because this is where there's real teeth that we'll start seeing in terms of the way the Congress is looking at these issues. And so for damages, for a civil action, here's what we're looking at. An individual may recover any of the following. An amount equal to the monetary gain made by the defendant from the creation, development, or disclosure of the intimate digital depiction or either of the following. The actual damages sustained by the individual as a result of the intimate digital depiction, including damages for emotional distress, or liquidated damages in the amount of $150,000. You can also get punitive damages, and then the cost of the action, including attorney's fees and other litigation costs reasonably incurred. So let's pause there. This is very important. This is very, very similar. If you've, if you've watched any of my um, many programs on intellectual property and copyright law, you'll be very familiar with statutory damages under the Copyright Act. And statutory damages under copyright law allow you to get up to $150,000 where there's been a willful infringement of copyright, even if the actual damages were 50 bucks. And so if you meet the prerequisites, you've registered timely, um, vis-a-vis -vis the infringement so that you can pursue statutory damages, that gives you the right to go to the jury and actually argue that you should get 150 grand even if the actual damages are only $50. And that is expressly envisioned, contemplated, and demanded by Congress as a particularly punitive way to punish and deter and compensate and you know, make sure people don't engage in those behaviors to compensate um, victims. The same structure Congress has borrowed, even down to the number, $150,000. Now they call it, interestingly here, liquidated damages as opposed to statutory damages, but it is the same basic concept. It's basically the idea that you can get the actual damages, but if it turns out the actual damages for some intimate dig digital depiction may be very low, maybe it was only you know disseminated to five people, only five people saw it, they didn't care, they didn't, nothing particularly happened, 
And so you have some small damages type claim, you claim general emotional distress, but maybe the jury thinks it's worth 20 grand, let's say. You can in the alternative say, well, I want liquidated damages of 150 grand, and you can get up to that, plus punitives. Now the punitive damages is another massive addition because here, unlike the Copyright Act, you cannot get punitive damages on top of the statutory damages. Here you can get punitive damages as well as liquidated damages. The difference, of course, being to the Copyright Act that the statutory damages in copyright are themselves serving a sort of punitive punishment type purpose in part. Here the liquidated damages are just your liquidated damages, that's what you get, and now you get additional punitives. Now importantly, it also has equitable relief built in. In a civil action under this section, a court may also, in, a, in addition to other relief available at law, give equitable relief, including, and this is what's important, TROs, preliminary injunctions, permanent injunctions, ordering the defendant to cease display or disclosure of the intimate digital depiction. Now you can imagine we're gonna certainly be envisioning cases down the road where it's not just injunctions aimed at the defendant, we also will see cases where injunctions are being aimed at the platforms, the social media platforms where these images exist, get replicated, get copied, you know, and users quickly retweet, repost, whatnot. And in order to get it taken down, plaintiff can't sue thousands of individual users. There will be um, claims for injunctive relief or takedowns issued to um, the platforms for this type of equitable relief. Now here's another important aspect to this statute and it actually provides expressly um, in the code as opposed to sort of general common law, which is the normal place this goes, this idea of anonymity. And so you may actually, you have the absolute statutory right to proceed confidentially using a pseudonym. So you can file under the name of Jane Doe, for example, um, by statutory right, you make out that you wanna keep anonymity um, and that's an express aspect of this, obviously, because part of the goal here is to not only remedy, compensate, and protect against um, deep fakes of intimate images, but it's not to make the situation worse by, by further publicizing who this is, which could augment the problem as opposed to sort of controlling it and delimiting it to the damage already done. Now that's that act, um, again, preventing deep fakes of intimate images, but now we're gonna talk briefly about the Deep Fakes Accountability Act. <clears throat> and you see on our next slide here, this is a second act that's pending that's dealing with deep fakes also. And this is looking at deep fakes and punishing improper deep fake stuff, but it's looking at it in a couple of ways. And so let's start with the general provisions of the Deep Fakes Accountability Act. Except as provided below, any person who, using any means or facility of interstate or foreign commerce, produces an advanced technological false personation record with the intent to distribute such record over the internet or knowledge that such record shall be so distributed, shall ensure such record complies with the requirements under B and in the case of audiovisual records, disclosure requirements under C. So let's take a look at B and C because this is important. Content provenance. Any advanced technological false personation record which contains a moving visual element shall contain technologies such as content provenance technologies that clearly identify such record as containing altered audio or visual elements or as having been entirely created through generative artificial intelligence or similar technologies. Let's pause here. This is really important. What this is saying is there is the right to create deep fakes, obviously. You can't do it in a way that's gonna run afoul of state law and run into trouble there. You can't do it in a way that's um, in, intimate sexual images, obviously, and, and do in, illegal and appropriate things there. But there are aspects and uses of deep fakes that people can make that are not illegal and unlawful. They're not always tripping people's right of publicity, right? Sometimes there's even fair use rights to do it. But what Congress is saying is, when you're gonna be making something that's fake, it's a deep fake ultimately, there's now labeling requirements. In other words, you must expressly and clearly make clear in that audio or visual and or audio visual program that this thing is AI and has been created through AI so that the world knows that it's a deep fake. Let's continue and see. Audiovisual disclosure. Any advanced 
technological false personation record containing both an audio and a visual element shall include not less than one clearly articulated verbal statement that identifies the record as containing altered audio and visual elements and a concise description of the extent of such alteration. Very important, um, notice disclosure. So it's gotta be clearly articulated verbally. It has to explain it concisely and explain where and how. And so I think what's very clear here, and this is where we will see immense litigation down the road is, is the articulation clear enough? Is it being buried to hide it, to trick people, to make them think it's real? Is it kind of some small print type thing in the middle of nowhere that no one sees, right? Those types of questions that we're all familiar with um, in the modern world of um, written disclosures, we now are gonna have verbal ones. And number two, an unobscured written statement in clearly readable text appearing at the bottom of the image throughout the duration of the visual element that identifies a record as containing altered audio and visual elements and a concise description of the extent of such alteration. So this is not only must there be a verbal statement um, somewhere in there that this is a deep fake, but then while you're watching the deep fake, so let's go back to the Tom Cruise one we saw. Under this Deep Fakes Accountability Act, if you imagine hypothetically that the person made that deep fake of Tom Cruise. Now, it's not being made for commercial purpose. It's not selling, you know, the new brand of tequila, right? So it's, it's not like there's someone's making money out of it. It's being done in some fair use type manner, let's assume, so that Tom Cruise can't get a takedown and stop it. Yet still, what needs to be in there in the beginning is that this is a deep fake. It's got to be in there verbally. And while you're watching all those videos of Tom Cruise, there'll be a requirement that there's an unobstructed written statement beneath that video that you're watching, making very clear that this is a deep fake. And you can imagine this is gonna create massive um, obligations on the creators of this stuff. And also secondarily, we will see questions about what do you do when the videos get re perhaps posted then on social media platforms, they get truncated and shortened. Is it readable? Is it close enough? Where do you see it? Is it unobscured or not? It's going to be a massive area of obviously future litigation to make sure that the disclosures are clear. And then finally, and I bolded for you, you can see number three here, there has to be a link, an icon, or some similar tool to signal that the content has been altered by or is a product of generative artificial intelligence or similar technology. And so you can imagine in the, in the coming years, there will be some standardized icon that we create that signals and connotes that this is AI, like maybe there'll be a, some, you know, AI swoosh type logo or something that's just standard, the way we have C with a circle around it is standard for copyright. We have other standard, um, you know, markers for all manner of things um, that, that, that exist in the world. There's gonna have to be some standard icon though that gets developed as sort of industry-wide standard that connotes AI based, right? Now, there's also criminal penalties. So this is not just a civil issue. And you can see on our next slide here, what happens criminally if you fail to disclose. And so this is where it gets scary for creators, republishers too, who are gonna be questioning, you know, do we have the right safe harbors, what's going on? But let's look at what happens if you fail to disclose. Whoever knowingly fails to comply with the requirements under subsection A, with the intent to humiliate or otherwise harass the person falsely exhibited. So you can see already, it's not just a failure to do it, there's this additional knowing requirement and an intent to actually harm and bother someone as opposed to just being perhaps negligent, right? But whoever does that, um, provided the advanced technological false personation record contains sexual content of a person engaging in sexual acts or in a state of nudity. So. If, if you do have a failure to disclose and you're doing this to humiliate someone and it's a sexual deep fake, you got criminal problems. And if you do it with the intent to cause violence or physical harm, incite armed or diplomatic conflict, or interfere in an official proceeding, including an election, provided the advanced record did in fact pose a credible threat, threat of instigating or advancing such conduct, in the course of criminal conduct related to fraud, including securities fraud or wire fraud, false personation or identity theft, or by a foreign power interfering in a federal state or terminal election. So you can see we have massive criminal penalties aimed already at looking down the road about how these deep fakes are gonna be used to damage people sexually, 
You can be indicted by the U.S. attorneys and sent to federal prison if you do it. But also, when we start seeing deep fakes being used to interfere in elections, incite perhaps conflict, where we now are also going to be looking at massive First Amendment questions, is the deep fake free speech or has it crossed that incitement line into um, unprotected speech? And if you want to learn more about that, of course, you can go watch our Curious Lawyer series on the Bill of Rights, including all um, 10 amendments. And we've got a special one on the First Amendment and a secondary program on hate speech in particular that lets, lets you really look at these lines between protected speech, incitement, unprotected speech. We will be seeing these questions litigated, though, under our Deep Fakes Accountability Act. Now, advanced technological false personation record itself is a very important defined term. And you can see here on the next slide, I bolded it for you. It means a deep fake, which a reasonable person having considered the visual or audio qualities of the record and the nature of the distribution would believe it accurately exhibits material activity of a living person, which the person did not in fact undertake, or the material activity of a deceased person, which the deceased person did not in fact undertake and the exhibition of which is substantially likely to either further a criminal act or result in improper interference in an initial proceeding, a public policy debate, or an election, and was produced without the consent of such living person or the deceased person or their heirs. And so what that means now is we now have a federalized right as it relates to deep fake uses in this one narrow area that covers all deceased persons. So it's not, remember when I talked to you earlier, some states don't even give a deceased a right of publicity. Here, full right of publicity for deceased persons and their heirs in these limited uses. So in other words, um, if you're running for president and you want Richard Nixon to give you a testimonial, you need to go to his heirs and get the right to create a deep fake of Richard Nixon giving you a testimonial. Um, the term deep fake also means any video recording, motion picture film, sound recording, electronic image or photograph or technological representation or speech or conduct, conduct substantially derivative thereof, which appears to authentically depict a speech or conduct who didn't actually engage in it. And so here we can imagine examples, for example, you take the famous John F. Kennedy speech he's giving where he's talking about, you know, why we choose to go to the moon. And someone does that rousing speech, but they alter his words to say, imagine, Peter is the greatest lawyer I've ever seen. That would be a great testimonial, right? If you do that, where it appears to authentically depict him, but it's been tweaked, now you're tripping again. It's a deep fake. You're tripping the violations of the Deep Fakes Accountability Act in terms of the definition here of what is a deep fake. And finally, there are civil penalties, as you see on our um, next slide here, um, in terms of damages again. We can, you can get actual damages if this is done inappropriately, and then there are civil penalties that go $50,000 per violation, $100,000. It can go up to if um, you created you know, further harm, and even up to $150,000 if it's got sexual content. So depending upon whether the deep fake is kind of political speech, low-level stuff, sexual, you have this staggered regime. Again, very similar to the Copyright Act in terms of the number, $150,000 is just clearly seen by Congress as being a number that we're gonna hit people with at the high end for engaging in improper conduct. And of course, you can also get injunctive relief. Um, <clears throat> let's just look at some limits here on our next slide um, in terms of the act. Um, there are limits and it doesn't apply to, for example, um, to material activities that can be perceived as being um, you know, fair game, basically. So if you create stuff um, of actual per performing artists with their consent, for example, it's okay. You're doing stuff in the editing of motion pictures and creating derivative movies and whatnot, that can, um, where the person gave consent, that can be okay. If it's in the context where you wouldn't mistake the falsified material for actual material, um, such as fictionalized stuff, that's okay. Or if it's created by employees of the U.S. in furtherance of public safety or national security, that can be okay. So there are built-in limits that they're looking at in terms of um, recognizing that this is running up against the First Amendment, fair use ideas. We have to be careful that we don't outlaw too much behavior. And in that vein, as you see here on our um, final slide relating to the Deep Fakes Accountability Act, we actually have an express demand by Congress that 
the attorney general actually look into figuring out proper standards to allow this technology to flourish and blossom and develop the same way we did with the internet to let people create stuff. Um, and so here the attorney general has been ordered to create a process by which creators of this stuff can come and get advisory opinions as to its legality. Um, and the attorney general needs to respond to those submissions, um, give good faith advisory opinions, um, create public procedures to cover the issuance of waivers um, that can exempt people from liability here. And so basically the idea here is that there needs to be a robust administrative regime that we create by the attorney general to let people in good faith come and say, hey, I need to be able to do these three things with my content. Can I do it without criminal exposure? And so we will see a robust new area here for intellectual property lawyers, especially now looking at digital right of publicity and deep fake stuff to start litigating and, and getting um, advisory opinion letters in this regime. So ultimately what we see here is that AI is meeting the law and the law has got a big future here. Um, we saw our examples of Morgan Freeman and Tom Cruise. And you can see here on this slide, our picture of our AI robot in the future and our legal steps, the two are colliding. We looked at the deep fake accountability law, which <clears throat> does create some early federalization of aspects of state right of publicity law. And these are both really very limited first steps to federalizing certain aspects of it with damages regime like copyright that can be punitive in, in nature to really give massive compensation and massive deterrence to improper use. And so AI really is meeting the law. The two are headbutting here. And as you see on my final conclusion slide here, ultimately AI is gonna win out. AI is here, like all new technologies, the genie won't be put back in the bottle. The law is going to have to adapt, um, learn how to deal with it. And we have these early um, federal statutes that are looking at it. We have our analog laws we saw from the state right of publicity regimes that ultimately now in this day and age, it really may be too antiquated, I suspect, to deal with this rapidly changing technology. We've seen voice and likeness in the analog world. In the digital world, it's very easy to recreate. It's going to create far more uses as we've already seen. And so I do think these pending federal laws and other federal laws will develop that won't even be delimited to commercial focus. We'll have non-commercial focus. They won't be limited only to sexual exploitation focus, although of course they're being nationalized right now in those areas. And then the big picture question that ultimately that we all have to answer by reaching out to our elected officials is, is it time to nationalize the right of publicity fully so that it joins copyrights, trademarks, patents, and trade secrets as having national protection? So there you have it, you curious lawyer. Deep fakes, you've got the overview, you've got it all. And if you have any questions, as always, please feel free to reach out and contact me. Thank you.